It's been a while, isn't it? <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Leanne. Welcome or welcome back to the channel where I talk about books and publishing and all those kinds of things. Although I haven't spoken about it in quite a while. I don't know if you've noticed, you probably haven't, but uh, I haven't made any videos for quite a while. I don't feel like I owe anyone an explanation for that, but I do just want to chat about it a little bit. I think in my last video I mentioned how slumpy I was feeling with making videos and with reading, but I said, you know, I'm gonna be back. Uh, and then I did not come back. In fact, the opposite happens. <laughs> I had a couple of like slumpy reading weeks and that has kind of continued into July and August. I am gonna be talking about 13 books that I read across those two months, which is still a lot of books. It's a lot less than what I was reading previously when I was at my mom's house. But if I'm being honest with how slumpy I was feeling with my reading, I'm not really sure how fully I engaged with a lot of the books that I was reading. And even though 13 books across two months is a lot, in previous months I was reading like 18, 19, 20 books in a month, which is not sustainable for me. The context of me reading that many books in a month was I essentially didn't have a social life. You know, I was at my mom's house. I was in Ireland. Ireland was still like in the depths of lockdown. I really wasn't doing anything apart from working, reading and making videos. Whereas now coming back to London, I'm spending a lot more time socializing, hanging out with friends, going out for drinks, for meals, going to shows and gigs, hanging out with my housemates, going to the gym again, and just all of those things that make me really happy. And reading kind of, it kind Kind of slipped away from me in a way. So because I wasn't fully engaging with my reading, I felt like there was nothing for me to talk about in videos. So I had a couple of weeks where I just felt really disengaged with everything and uh, then I got COVID. I don't want to talk about having COVID too much, um, but I'm fine. Um, even at kind of the worst symptoms that I experienced, they were very manageable for me. I do feel very fortunate about that and as far as I'm aware, I don't have anything that is long-standing, although we'll see. <laughs> I feel completely and totally fine. Obviously, I would really recommend continuing to take precautions and stay safe and get yourself tested and wear your masks. Like, it was not fun. It was not enjoyable. It was manageable. And I think I do just want to add a bit of balance to the conversation around getting COVID because one of the things I really struggled with when I first realised that I was showing symptoms was the amount of the amount of tweets in particular and I ended up deleting Twitter off my phone when I first started showing symptoms the amount of tweets of people sharing how terrible their experiences are and while I think it's really important to acknowledge that so people understand the real risk of catching covid and transmitting it to other people seeing all of those tweets gave me so much anxiety in the really early days of it that made me feel terrible it made me feel terrified it made me feel so anxious so maybe if you are in the position where you think you might have some symptoms do definitely take it seriously and stay as safe as possible not only for yourself but for everyone else but like me you could be very fortunate with how it has impacted your body and your lifestyle but i think it's just it's not worth getting really terrified of the unknown i don't know if i'm gonna leave that chat in there because i feel like it might be slightly controversial but so anyway, I had a couple of weeks where I was just not filming and then I got poorly and kind of gave myself like two weeks to properly recover from that and then it felt like I'd been away for a really long time and my reading was still slumpy and then I had like this mental block with just sitting down in front of a camera again. It felt like this huge mountain to overcome and it made me start questioning whether I wanted to even do booktube because I wasn't really missing it but in the past week or so that feeling of wanting to sit down in front of a camera has started to come back so I think actually having a pretty big break from making videos has actually been really really good for me. I know some booktubers talk about they will like once a year take a month off from making videos and that seems like a pretty good idea to me actually I feel the better of it in some ways but anyway let's talk about the books that I read in July and August as I said I don't know how fully engaged I was with a lot of these books especially with some of them that I read in July like my memory's a little bit hazy and you just have to accept that okay try my best this is Hope Nicely's Lessons for Life by Caroline Day this is actually a book that helped me realize why I was in a reading slump in addition to all of like the socializing and having a busier life kind of thing it made me realize that because things were so busy again, I was trying to read in like 15, 20 minute chunks, which is just not how I read. I need to like properly sit down and read for like at least 45 minutes. And I realized that when I took myself out on a little date to a cafe, just got myself a coffee and just read for as long as I felt like it. And 
I read probably about I think like 50% of this book and I realized oh yes that's my reading style I have to sit down for a massive chunk of time. So this book is about our 25 year old protagonist Hope Nicely who lives with her mother. She lives a very normal life, um, she's got a job walking dogs, but we know she's part of a writing group where she wants to write about her life story and that is really centered around her figuring out why her biological mother abandoned her in a cardboard box when she was a baby and figuring out if her biological mother knew that the heavy drinking that she partook in while pregnant would lead to Hope being born with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Hope doesn't feel like she really fits in with people around her, she communicates differently, she sees the world in a different perspective, she doesn't necessarily understand things in the same way that other people around her do and the book is very much written in Hope's voice. We are really in her head. I don't know anyone with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder so I don't know how kind of accurate that is but to me the voice in this book seemed very authentic. It's a novel that is about kindness and acceptance. It's a book that celebrates difference and it's a book that embraces forgiveness. The Lock-In by Phoebe Luckhurst. This was one of my five star predictions and it did not disappoint. I really enjoyed this book. As opposed to a locked room mystery, this is a locked room rom-com. This novel is about housemates Ellen, Alexa and Jack. Ellen comes downstairs one day to discover that the kitchen is flooded. The housemates go up to their attic thinking that they can cut off the water supply from there, but they end up getting locked in the attic. But it's not just those three in there. Alexa's date from the night before is also in there with them and these four cannot communicate with the outside world or in fact they don't think they can. Jack is the only one who has brought his phone upstairs with him but he's saying that he doesn't have any signal when he is in fact in the very brief moments where he connects to the wi-fi he is live tweeting everything that is going on including the drama of Ellen realizing that she knows Alexa's date from somewhere in her past and I enjoyed the drama of that so much. I loved seeing how it all unfolded and resolved, how she actually knew this guy and this book just really tapped into that kind of like being young and in a London house share like that kind of thing. It just fully captured that. All of the characters in this felt like people I've met or people I could know. They felt so genuine and authentic. The way they spoke felt really honest. The way they interacted felt really honest. If you're looking for a book that is just so much fun and also if you are a young person, especially a young woman in a house share who is also navigating dating, then this book will make you feel validated and seen. Then definitely pick this one up. It was just so much fun. I also read The Love Square by Laura Jane Williams. This is the second book from this author that I've read. I previously read Our Stop and I really loved it. I've actually recently read her latest novel, The Lucky Escape, but that can wait for my September wrap up. I will say at this point, out of those three novels, this one is probably my least favourite, but I still had a good time. This novel is about Penny Bridge, who is, of course, unlucky in love. A change in circumstances leads her to start a new life in a new town, where the last thing she expects is to meet a man. And as the blurb says, and another one, and another one. Let me just tell you at this point, it is not a love square. There are no surprises in which guy she actually likes and actually ends up with. Like, I do not feel like that's a spoiler. And I actually feel really lucky that I'd already heard that from Katie at Books and Things because I feel like I would have gone into it expecting, obviously, a love square if I hadn't heard her review of it that told me it's really not a love square. To the point where the other two guys do not remember a thing about them. In fact, I am kind of struggling to remember a lot of other stuff about this book. One thing I did think was really great was the way it engaged with our main character wanting to become a mother and exploring her options for that, whether she wants to do it independently, do it solo, do it without a guy, and explores her experiences of wanting to be pregnant after facing a serious illness. That was something that I hadn't really read much about before and I think that is the really compelling plot line in this book. The romance plot I didn't find as compelling as that aspect of Penny's story. In saying that, if if you're looking for a fun read, if you have read any of Laura Jane Williams' other books, I think you would find this a lot of fun. But for me, not the most memorable rom-com that I've ever read. But, you know, I had a good time. Next, I read All This Has Nothing To Do With Me by Monica Cibolo. I read this in one sitting and I'm not fully sure I understood it. This book is essentially about an unhappy love affair and it's told in these really disjointed, fragmented ways of storytelling. It's about someone who has that kind of obsessive, crazy in love kind of thing when they first meet someone. And when the other person's interest in them fades, 
they begin to spiral. The novel is told in not only through text but also through photos, photos of objects that have some kind of significance in this relationship, in this affair. It is told in emails, it's told in letters. I did find it interesting piecing all of those things together, you know, what do we learn about the dynamic between these two characters just based on all of these objects. So I did think it was interesting, I did think it was a cool way of telling the story but it's not something that has really stayed with me. Maybe it is something that really suffered from my slumpy reading mood and I should potentially give this a reread, you know it's very short, I, like I definitely could. One book that I think I should definitely reread is the only non-fiction book I'm going to be talking about today and that is Border Nation, A Story of Migration by Leah Cohen. This is part of Pluto Press's Outspoken series. I read three books from this series last year and they were all in my top 10 non-fiction reads of the year. This series really takes some big topics and outlines them in great detail and depth but without making them too complicated to understand. The authors in each of these books, and a different author has written each of them, knows their topic so fluently that they are able to explain it to you in a really accessible way. And this one is about borders, it is about migration, it is about geographical lines and how they impact our society. It is about the inhumanity of deportations, it is about the rise in racist attacks in Britain after the Brexit referendum. I don't think I fully digested everything in this book, so I think it is definitely something Something that I should be rereading. I think a lot of us are thinking about migration and freedom of movement at the moment. I was actually reading this in the last week or so of the Euros, the football tournament, and I think it was really interesting reading it at that time where, you know, there was a lot of English pride around the place. So I think reading this book in the context of that being going on was really interesting but I think it's something that I should definitely revisit as well and if you are someone who is interested in learning more about this topic then I would really recommend picking it up as well as the other books in the series that look at other topics as well. I read The Fell by Sarah Moss. This one isn't coming out until November and it is Sarah Moss's essentially her Covid novel. <laughs> did I decide to read this when I had Covid? Yes I did. <laughs> this is set in November 2020 and it is about a woman who is in her two week quarantine period and she is feeling really confined and cooped up in her small house and she decides to go on a walk. She thinks she's gonna go out on this walk, come back, no one's gonna know, she's not gonna see anyone, it's gonna be fine. She just cannot cope with this isolation anymore. However, on this walk she falls badly and injures herself and she doesn't come home. And this eventually leads to a mountain rescue mission. Not only are we getting her thoughts during this experience, but there are lots of people who are connected to her life in some way that we get the really intimate reflections from. For instance, her son, and that was the perspective that I found really the most compelling. His fears around not really understanding what is happening with Covid at all, but also knowing that his mother shouldn't have left the house. He is worried about her, but he doesn't know if he should tell anyone because she should have been quarantining. Is she going to get in trouble for quarantining? Is she going to get a massive fine? They can't afford a massive fine. What is he supposed to do? We get a perspective from the neighbours who has noticed that she's gone out for a walk and that really taps into the period of Covid where I think everyone was kind of judging each other for their behaviour and we also get perspectives from those involved in the rescue mission. This book really taps into so many complicated feelings that so many people have felt in the past year and a half and there are so many touching observations in this book as well about the passage of time and this feeling of having lost time. It's exactly what you would expect from Sarah Moss and I'm not massively into reading Covid books, I don't think it's something that I really want to do, but I trusted Sarah Moss so much and she didn't disappoint. I also read a poetry collection, I read The Casual Perfect by Lavinia Greenlaw. I don't really think this was a poetry collection for me, it's a book that has a lot to do with landscape, it's about the cycles of the skies and like solstices and equinoxes. It's a book that is about travel. I have been struggling with poetry lately. I've been trying to read poetry when I can, if not full collections and bits here and there to try and get back into reading poetry in the way that I used to, in the way that I was really engaged with. But I think I really need to be more selective about the poetry that I'm picking up and making sure it's the right poetry for me. You may remember that I picked up this poetry collection as well as a few others uh, very affordably when they were discounted in one of my favourite bookstores in Dublin a few months ago. And I'm glad that I gave it a go, you know it only cost me like 
199 so I don't like regret it or anything but this wasn't really the collection for me and I don't really remember much about it if I'm being completely honest. I also read Love in Colour by Balu Babalola. This was also one of my five star predictions and unfortunately it wasn't five stars but I did really really enjoy it. I think I think it's just not worth me putting short story collections into my five star predictions because there is such a variance in how much I enjoy particular stories and I don't feel like I get immersed in short stories in the same way I would with a five star novel. Most of these stories are retellings of ancient myths from lots of different parts of the globe but I particularly enjoyed reading stories that were influenced by African mythology. They felt really fresh and even though I didn't recognise the myths that they were retelling I think the stories really stood on their own two feet without having the context of the myths. Obviously, I think if you are someone who knows about those stories, you will get even more from reading them because you will be able to recognise those elements of the original stories and how the author has reinterpreted them for a modern audience, but also for a female audience where the woman is centred in these stories. Some of these stories are about love at first sight. Some of them are about long term love. Some of them are about passionate affairs. Some of them are about the realisation of the importance of self-love over romantic love. It's about how love can come in so many different forms. The storytelling is so rich and detailed and there's a real delicacy and artistry to the way this author tells her stories. As I said, not all of them were favourites for me. Some of them I didn't love. In most instances, purely because I wanted a whole novel about these characters. I think a short story collection is just never really going to get five stars from me and I need to accept that. But if you haven't picked this one up yet and you are looking for something that is romantic, is about, is about love and relationships, but you are possibly a more literary reader, then I think I would really recommend this one for you. Next, I read Honey and Issues Guide to Fake Dating by Adiba Jagadar. I haven't even hauled this one yet, but I couldn't resist reading it. By the way, I have a lot of books to haul. You know my like TBR challenge? Like, fuck that. Like, anyway, that's for another video. So this novel is about Honey and Issue. They both go to secondary school together. They are in fifth year in Ireland, so they're about 16, 17. Honey has recently come out to her two friends. These are two friends that she has had since childhood, all the way up through her teenage years. She's recently come out to them as bisexual, but they don't seem to understand that or even want to understand that. There's a lot of biphobia towards Hanny. They don't really believe her because she's never dated a girl. And we also have Issue who feels like she has a lot to prove, particularly to her parents. Like she feels like her older sister is like the golden child and she's never really been able to live up to her sister. And she thinks the way to do that is to become head girl. But in order to become head girl, she needs to be popular and that's something that she isn't. So, Hanny and Issue start fake dating. So for Hanny, dating a girl gives validity to her sexuality. It proves it to the people around her. And for Issue, if she's going to become popular enough to be head girl, being in a relationship with Hanny is really going to help her do that. But as they start to get closer and their lives start to intertwine, of course, some real feelings start coming into the mix there and it's so cute. There is that really like, wholesome fluffy romance between Hanny and Issue but they also have really complex and rich lives independent of that relationship. Hanny's experience of her friends not really wanting to understand her sexuality was something that definitely ran true to me as a bisexual woman. Like some of the conversations that Hanny has with her friends I was like yeah I feel this I know what you're feeling in this moment. And Hanny is also coming to realize that as she and her friends become fully formed humans you know as they you know, grow up as they become young adults. The friendships that she has with these girls that she has had from primary school just aren't working as they grow up. And I think that's something that a lot of people can relate to. You know, for Issue, she has that complicated relationship with her sister where her sister really wants to be there for her, but Issue still feels like she's in competition with her older sister. There's also so much in this book about being both Bengali and Muslim in Ireland, what that is like, how that has changed over the years and what hasn't changed. And that was a really fascinating aspect and important aspect of this book. I loved this even more than I loved The Henna Wars. If you enjoyed The Henna Wars, I think you will like this one even more. I think it is, I, th I think it's a much better book than The Henna Wars was. And I say that having loved The Henna Wars. So 
I highly recommend this one. I'm going to finish up with some books that I read from work, starting with Dear Martin by Nick Stone. This is a book from our backlist, but it was an author that I hadn't read from before, and I'm really keen to read more from this author, especially after reading Dear Martin. This follows our main character, Justice, who is top of his class in an Ivy League school. And one day, when he goes out driving with his friend Manny, the loud music that they're playing leads to a white police officer becoming confrontational and shots are fired. It is of course a book that really engages with themes of racial injustice and police brutality. It engages with these topics in a way that I think is really sensitive for the teenage age demographic that this book is aiming towards, but also a way that doesn't shy away from the realities of this situation, the realities of this is something that all black men and black boys Fear. I think the way the author facilitates conversations around race and prejudice are done in a way that is really accessible but also really interwoven into the text. It doesn't feel like this is the bit where we are going to talk about this topic to do with race. It all feels really integrated into the story. Really keen to read more books from this author. I think they are absolutely fantastic and I, yeah I'm just really keen to get my hands on more of their books. And I also have some proofs that I read from work starting with Hide and Secrets by Sophie McKenzie. This one is already out now. So this is about 14 year old Kat whose father is missing and a dead. Obviously her whole family are really struggling to cope with this, to come to terms with it. Her little sister is refusing to speak. One day Kat is contacted and some new information about her father's disappearance and assumed death comes to light. Alongside her new neighbour, the very handsome Tyler, they go off on a journey to discover what exactly is the truth about her father's disappearance. It's a journey that takes them across country, that leads them to interact with dangerous gangs. There's a plot to steal a priceless jewel. There are so many plot twists in here. And I think this is particularly great for readers who are interested in that teen thriller genre. So like Holly Jackson, Karen M. McManus, but maybe are a little bit young and are looking for a gateway into those novels. This would be perfect. I also read How I Saved the World in a Week by Polly Ho Yen. This one is also already out now. So this is a middle grade book that is about a young boy and his relationship with his mother. His mother has always prepared him for something. She is giving him these survival and wilderness skills. He's never really known what she is preparing him for, but he knows that these rules of how to survive are so important. One day his mother ends up going too far and she's taken away from him. He is sent to live with his father that he doesn't really know and everyone really dismisses his mother's concerns for not only her son's safety and her own safety but everyone's safety. She thinks that there are these creatures called the greys that pose a threat to everyone and as the novel progresses we realise that they shouldn't have dismissed her so easily. It's a book that really engages with complicated family dynamics. It's a book that really engages with mental health and a way that validates the very genuine anxieties of people that have mental health issues, but also acknowledges that people still need help. But really what stood out to me in this book was this young boy navigating the complicated position that he holds between his two parents. It's a book that has a lot of important messages in it but also in this really page-turning story for kids. And the final book I'm going to talk about is The Trial by Laura Bates. This comes out on the 16th of September so not long to wait and it's absolutely fantastic. Laura Bates you may know for her feminist writing and activism, you may know her from books like Everyday Sexism, Girl Up, Misogynation. This book is just such a cool idea. So, so this book is about a group of seven teenagers who are on a flight home. They are on their way back from this basketball tournament, so a lot of the guys were competing in the basketball tournament and the girls were the cheerleaders. The dynamics between those two groups is very interesting, but also the dynamics within that group are very interesting. A lot of these kids are very privileged, but there is even a hierarchy within that level of privilege. And I think the way the author engaged with that was really interesting. But these seven teenagers end up stranded on this desert island and they need to survive. That in itself is interesting enough. Like how are all these rich kids gonna figure out how to navigate the wilderness? But we also find out that something very terrible has happened the night before the plane crash at a party. It's a book that is about sexual assault. It's a book that tackles these topics very head on. It's a book that really discusses the patriarchy and the sexism that young women face, the willful ignorance that both boys and girls can have around rape and sexual assault. And I think putting it in this setting of all of these teenagers being stuck together on this desert island is just such a fascinating vehicle to explore all of these things. As the novel progresses, 
things start happening to these teenagers and it seems like the island is the one taking revenge. Read this in two sittings, thought it was fantastic. Highly recommend it if you have enjoyed Laura Bates writing before. If you have enjoyed books by Louise O'Neill or Juno Dawson, I think you would really love this. And it's one that I definitely want to reread as well. And when I want to reread something, that's the sign of me thinking it's a great book. So there we have it. They are all of the books that I have been reading in the past couple of months. I feel like I'm back. I mean, I need to edit this first, but you know, if you're seeing this, I've edited it, so well done me. I feel like I've ripped off a plaster, do you know what I mean? I feel like now that I've done this wrap up, I am back. So normally at the end of my wrap ups, I will tell you what number my TBR stands at. However, I could tell you that, but the way my brain works is books don't come onto my TBR until I've hauled them in a video. And as we've established, I haven't made a video in quite a while, but a lot of books, lot of books have come into my life. The next video that you're probably gonna see is gonna be a freaking massive haul. So I could tell you what my TBR technically stands at, but in a few days, that number is gonna go up quite dramatically. So do you know what? Do you want me to tell you anyway? Um, okay, technically my TBR stands at this number, but there are lots of new books on this shelf that I haven't hauled yet. And um, yeah, it's not gonna be at this number when I next speak to you. That's all for me today. All of the books that I've mentioned will be linked down below in the description so you can check them out if you wanna find out more. If you have anything you wanna talk about in the comments, if you've read any of these books and wanna chat about them, if any of them have piqued your interest, let me know and we can have a chat. I am aware that I've also been terrible at replying to comments during my absence. I'm trying to catch up. If you don't have anything in particular you wanna mention down in the comments, leave me a little celebration emoji so I know that you're over the moon that I'm back. I hope you guys are doing well and I will speak to you in my next video. Guess who's back?